Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the McMaster Alumni Association. My name is Blake, um, and I'm excited to talk to you today about space, galaxies, and black holes. Thanks again for tuning in and for all of your wonderful questions. We had quite a few questions about black holes, um, so I'm excited to get through some of those. Um, I'm a first year master's student at McMaster, and I study uh, the gas content in other galaxies. So I use telescope observations to, to try to understand uh, the properties of this gas um, in galaxies other than the Milky Way. But we have lots to get through, so let's get started. Um, our first question today comes from Jacob a grade two student in Ottawa, and they ask, how many galaxies are there in the universe? And I think this is a great question, Jacob, to get us started on our webinar today. Um, and unfortunately, where most of us are in, in these bigger cities in Ontario, we aren't able to look up in the night sky and see something as beautiful as this. But if you were in Northern Ontario, you might be able to look up and see the extent of the Milky Way and all of these little point sources. And these are the stars in uh, the Milky Way galaxy. Now, unfortunately, most galaxies were unable to see with our own eyes. Um, but early astronomers were, were confused and they would question what's going on in these dark spots of the night sky. What's, what's happening here? We see lots of stars and, and objects throughout the night sky, but what's going on in these dark patches? And in the early 1900s, a scientist and astronomer named Edwin Hubble um, discovered the first galaxy in, in the universe other than the Milky Way. And since then, there's been a telescope named after Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope, which you may have heard of before. Um, it's a famous telescope that was launched in the late 1990s and, and has continued taking observations through the 21st century. But what Hubble gives us the opportunity to do is point at one of these dark patches um, in the night sky and take a long picture. And by pointing the telescope at one single place and, and leaving it there for a long time, we're able to find out more information and gather more light um, from that one dark patch. And what we see is this complete zoo um, of different galaxy structures and colors. And we see these brilliant bright blue spiral galaxies and these large red ellipticals. And we actually open our eyes up to, to the, the amount of galaxies that there are in the universe, the extensive number. And it's actually estimated that there are more than two trillion galaxies in the universe. In this image alone, this Hubble um, deep field image, there's about 5,500. So much more than we can see when we just look up at the night sky with our own eyes. But uh, the, invent, the invent of telescopes like Hubble allows us to, to see these, these galaxies in the universe. Our second question today comes from Ava, a grade three student in Hamilton, and they ask, what is the closest galaxy to Earth? Thank you for your question, Ava. This is a great question. And the, the closest spiral galaxy to the Milky Way, um, and I say spiral because the Milky Way itself is also a spiral galaxy, the closest spiral galaxy is Andromeda, or sometimes called M31. And we can see that it's a spiral because of these nice dusty arms that it has um, that spiral towards the central bright region. And M31 or Andromeda has some close by neighbors. Here's M32, this little companion off to the left, and then NGC 205, a dwarf galaxy that's just below Andromeda. But Andromeda is close. It's about 2 million light years away, but it's not the closest. Moving closer, we have the large and small Magellanic clouds. And these are, again, dwarf galaxies, but they they're a little bit more irregular in shape. We can see the large one up here on the right and this small Magellanic cloud here on the left. And they're closer, they're only maybe 163,000 light years away. Um, and what's interesting about the large, small Magellanic clouds and Andromeda is they're actually on a collision course for the Milky Way. In about 5 billion years or so, uh, these galaxies are going to merge with the Milky Way and they're going to have some big interaction um, as the two galaxies collide. And speaking of colliding galaxies, that brings us to, to answering your question, Ava, about what is the closest galaxy to the Milky Way. Um, and this is the Canis Major Galaxy. Now, the Canis Major Galaxy is so close, it's about 25,000 light years from the sun, uh, about the same distance the sun is towards the center of the Milky Way. 
but the Canis major galaxy is so close that it's already interacting with the Milky Way. And what I mean by that is we have this big, long stream of material that's being torn off of the Canis major galaxy as the Milky Way essentially eats it or begins to, to absorb it into its structure. So the closest galaxy to us is the Canis major, um, and it's already interacting with the Milky Way. Our next question this morning comes from Madeline, a grade five student in Dundas, and they ask, how are galaxies created and why do they have different shapes? Now, this is another great question, and uh, thank you, Madeline. And it's actually something that uh, researchers and astronomers are studying in great detail at McMaster University. Now, um, this is a kind of a complicated topic and a complex question, so I'll try to answer it for you, Madeline. Um, again, we go back to Edwin Hubble. And in the early 1900s, he developed a classification scheme where he broke galaxies into two types, the ellipticals, these round spherical galaxies with a bright center, and the spiral galaxies, much like the Milky Way, where we have a bright center and these spiral arms uh, moving off of it. And you can see a nice spiral galaxy here with a bright center, lots of stars that are twinkling. It's very bright, maybe a little bit blue in color. Um, and then down here, we have a diffuse, bright elliptical galaxy with a bright center, but the light kind of fades away as we move around from the side. Now Hubble believed that um, galaxies in the universe started as ellipticals and moved along what is called the Hubble tuning fork and moved towards uh, these spiral galaxies. So he called the ellipticals the early type galaxies and the spirals the late type galaxies. But now um, with telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope, um, we've actually been able to discover um, all sorts of shapes and sizes of galaxies. And we have irregular galaxies, which maybe don't fall into the classification of ellipticals or spirals on their own. And we've also discovered that maybe Hubble um, was wrong in his idea that ellipticals were first and then uh, formed spirals after the fact. We actually think now that um, after the universe started um, with the theory of the Big Bang, and um, a little bit of time passed as the universe grew in size, the first stars were formed. Um, and these stars were either formed on their own or in stellar clusters, uh, many groups of stars. And then these stars would come together uh, under the influence of gravity and form the first galaxies. Um, and this theory is sort of a building of structure. We start with the small objects and we join them together due to gravity and we build them up to the larger objects like galaxies. And then as these galaxies continue to form and develop, they continue to join together and make groups or clusters, associations of more than one galaxy. And what we believe now is that these final galaxy clusters, um, as spiral galaxies enter these galaxy clusters, they lose lots of their material and they become ellipticals. So we think that these so-called late type galaxies form first. And then as they form their stars and reach the end of their lives, they become the more red and dead uh, elliptical galaxies in these galaxy clusters. And of course, telescopes like Hubble, you can see here on, on the left, are um, helping us to understand this evolution of galaxies. Our, our next few questions get us started on our discussion of black holes. Uh, the first one comes from Nova, a grade three student from Manitouan Island um, in Ontario. And they ask, how are black holes created? And then Aubrey, a grade five student from Burlington, um, asks, why do black holes exist in the first place? So these are two great questions to get us started on black holes, so thank you. Um, and they're a little bit similar, so I'm going to answer them together. Um, most people might not uh, know that black holes actually come from the death of a star. So when we have a star, um, it can go through two different life cycles. We either have a normal or average star, similar to our own sun in our solar system, or we can have what's called a massive star. And these stars are maybe eight or 10 times bigger than, than our own sun. Now, we're going to focus on this pathway um, because the massive stars, the ones that are eight or 10 times bigger than our sun, um, are going to be the ones that maybe will form black holes at the end of their lives. So they start um, as a cloud of gas and they collapse to form massive stars. And then as they evolve in their lifetime, um, they'll become these large red supergiants. Um, and because they're so massive, at the end of their lives, they'll start to collapse in on themselves. They no longer have the pressure or the material inside 
um, that's sufficient to support themselves against gravitational collapse. And what that means is that they will actually start to implode within on themselves and, and shrink in size, but all of the mass still remains. So it's you're taking this entire mass of the star and shrinking it into a very small point. Um, and because the star is so massive, it's unable to support itself and prevent this collapse from continuing on until we reach all of the mass into the tiny uh, central region, a very dense region, and that's what becomes the black hole. Now, these stellar mass black holes, they don't uh, just sit there after they've, um, after they've finished their lives. They, they actually are able to interact with their neighbors if there are neighbor stars nearby or maybe the gas and the dust. So we can see this black hole here that actually has what's called an accretion disk or it has a disk of gas and dust um, as it absorbs the material from this nearby star and was able to grow um, in size a little bit. Now we also can have supermassive black holes and these ones are formed by the collision or the interaction between two of these smaller black holes. Um, and when we have galaxies interact, much like when the Milky Way will interact with Andromeda in the future, um, the, the black holes at the centers of those galaxies will also eventually merge and form bigger, bigger black holes. So they can form from the end uh, of a star's life or also from these interaction um, and joining of two galaxies. Our next question comes from Samantha and they want to know how many black holes do we know of? Um, this is a great question. And um, unfortunately I don't have a number for you, Samantha, but thank you for your question. Um, I'll try to answer it by, by again, showing this Hubble deep field image. Now we know that um, most galaxies uh, like the Milky Way have a black hole at the center. So that's what is responsible for the, the orbit of the sun around the center of the Milky Way. Um, and, and when we look at the near, nearest galaxies, we can have these observations that maybe um, show us that they might have a black hole at the center. Now, it's really hard to take a picture of a black hole, as we'll see in a, a few uh, questions coming up. But we think that uh, the majority of, of black holes, uh, of majority of galaxies have black holes in the center. And, and this might be responsible for the, the dynamics and, and holding all that material in. So that being said, if we remember back to this image and we have all of these different galaxies, if each one of them has the opportunity or the potential to have a black hole in the center, that means that we could have countless black holes out there in the universe. Um, again, just in this image alone, we have about 5,500 um, black holes or 5,500 galaxies. So that could be 5,500 black holes. Also, if we look at this image, again, we have um, countless number of stars in this Northern Ontario night sky. And at the end of a massive star's life, it will also form a black hole. Um, and these black holes are not at the centers of galaxies. So they're a lot harder for us to observe or, or find. Because black holes don't emit light, that means that we'll have um, these, these massive stars that end their lives, they become these black holes, and then they'll just sit there alone in the universe, um, not interacting with any other material, and they'll be very, very challenging for us to find um, with the telescope. We'll have, we'd have to use other um, means of trying to understand or find these, uh, these black holes. Um, but what that might mean is in the Milky Way alone, there could be tens of billions of galaxies of black holes um, from stars that ended their lives. Our next two questions come from KN, a grade two student from Dundas, and they want to know how big are black holes. And then Diego, a grade eight student from Ancaster, also wants to know how big can black holes be. Thank you both for your questions. Uh, these are great, and it's a good segue as we continue our conversation on black holes this morning. So there are essentially three types of black holes that we believe exist in the universe. The first is supermassive black holes. Now, these black holes are, as the name might suggest, extremely heavy and big. We can have a black hole that's 10,000 times heavier than our own sun, but it fits into um, a space that's two times smaller. So you can think of something that's half the size of the sun, but it has 10,000 suns crammed into it. It's extremely heavy, extremely dense, and in a very small volume. Supermassive black holes can be even bigger, however. And you can see, here's the tiny little sun, this little dot here on the right. 
um, and we can have black holes that are 100 times bigger than the sun and 1 billion times heavier. That means we will cram 1 billion suns into this little small region. And these supermassive black holes are the ones that exist at the centers of galaxies. Um, specifically, they will continue to grow in size as the galaxies merge and interact with other galaxies. The second type of black holes that we think might exist but are actually quite challenging for us to observe in the universe are these intermediate mass black holes. And these are about 1,000 times heavier than the sun, but they're similar size to the Earth. So that's as if we were taking 1,000 suns and squishing it into an area the size of the Earth. So black holes, they're not actually that big. They're, they can be um, the size of the Earth or smaller, but they're extremely heavy and extremely dense. And finally, the last type are these stellar mass black holes, which again form when these massive stars finish their life cycle. Um, and if we think this is the Hamilton region here, and here's Dundas, and here's Ancaster, and Toronto's up here at the top of the, of the, the picture, a, a stellar mass black hole can be 10 times heavier than the sun, so as if we have 10 suns, but we squish it into an area that's maybe 30 kilometers across. And what that means is we have here on the left a circle that's 50 kilometers across, and you'd be able to drive from, from Hamilton to, to Toronto, In it would take you longer to drive from Hamilton to Toronto than it would for you to drive across this black hole. So it's an extremely heavy, dense black hole, but it's in a very small area. So they can be quite small as well. It's going to be 30 kilometers across. That's, that's pretty small. Um, and as I said, these stellar black holes, uh, the ones that form at the end of stars' lives, and these supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies are the ones that we mainly um, are able to observe or find in the universe and that we theoretically think exist, like these stellar black holes we know that when a massive star ends its life it should form a black hole. Um, Einstein told us that in the early 1900s. But these intermediate mass black holes, um, they're quite challenging to find. We're not really sure how they might be, be made um, because it would take quite a few of these stellar black holes to join together in order to make an intermediate mass black hole. Um, so this is still an open research question that scientists and astronomers are trying to answer. Our next question comes from Carlos, a grade 10 student from Ancaster, and they ask, how do we take a picture of black holes? And this is a great question, Carlos, thank you. Um, and I'm happy to be able to answer it for you today um, because last April in 2019, um, a collaboration of over 200 international researchers were able to take the first picture of a black hole. This black hole is at the center of a nearby galaxy called M87, um, and it looks like this. This is an extremely um, beautiful image of a black hole shadow here in the center and the emitting and extremely hot and, and intensely energetic gas surrounding that black hole. So unfortunately, we're not able to actually take a picture of the black hole itself, but we instead are able to observe this material surrounding it. Um, and then we can see the shadow of the black hole here in the center which lets us know that it's there. And now this is an incredibly challenging um, image to obtain um, and requires the use of telescopes that are, on the, that are as big as the planet Earth itself. And what I mean by that is we actually use telescopes spread all over the world to observe the same center um, of M87 in order to get this picture of this black hole. So we have eight telescopes known as the Event Horizon Telescope that work together. They all take a picture of the same um, location at the same time. And through computer analysis, we're able to piece those pictures together from the individual telescopes and create this beautiful image that we see um, of, of the black hole in M87. So you can see there's a few, um, few telescopes here in North and Central America, one over here in Europe, and then some in South America as well. There's even one on the South Pole in, in Antarctica. Um, and just as a brief aside, this telescope here in Chile in South America, ALMA, is the one that I use in my research here at McMaster University. Rowan, a grade five student from Dundas, asks, how can black holes bend light? Thank you for your question, Rowan. This is a great question. Um, and if you don't mind, I will start by, by answering 
how a star or how our own sun might bend light. Um, the, the principle or the idea is the same when we move towards a black hole. Um, we can think um, by solving the equations of general relativity, which Einstein developed in the early 1900s, of having something like a bed sheet stretched over a surface. And if you were to put a ball in the center of that bed sheet, we can think that um, it might cause a little bit of an indent in that bed sheet. And in the same way, a mass like the sun will cause this indent in what's known as space time. So we have the space all around us and the time through which we're traveling and progressing forward as, as, we, as we grow. Um, and we have a mass will cause an indent or something to cause a bend in that space, like a space time itself. And, and what's, what happens is a star that might be somewhere um, far off in the distance will emit light and that light will travel along in a straight line until it reaches this bend in space time. And then the light will start to curve and it will follow, will continue to follow a straight line, but it will move through this now curved space. It's like if you're going around a, a banked curve with your car, you can feel that curve pushing you around the corner. Now the star, the light from the star will continue to bend until we see it here on earth. Um, and we'll actually think that the star is over here. That's where we'll think we see the star um, from Earth. But in reality, the star has its light bent around the sun. And in the same way, we have a black hole um, bend the light from the star. Now, the, the amount of bending and this, this depression that we see in space-time depends on how heavy the object is. So a black hole, for example, which is much, much heavier than the sun, will cause an even bigger hole in the space time and an even um, larger amount of bending of this light. So in that case, we'll see the light from the star maybe bend all the way around um, and we'd be actually be observing stars that are a little bit further away or, or more off to the side as the light gets bent from this black hole. Now, um, what's really interesting about this and a, a great tool that we can use is the amount of bending depends on how heavy that black hole is. So if we are able to understand how much the light has bent, we can work backwards and try to figure out how heavy that black hole needs to be. One um, beautiful image of, of how this works is what's known as an Einstein ring. And we can see this ring of light um, as it bends around this cluster of galaxies here in the center. So this, this ring is actually one object that's behind this cluster of galaxies and the light gets bent around on its way towards us. And we can see this galaxy as it's spread out um, in a ring structure um, and it's re reflected or and refracted around uh, this, this cluster of galaxies. Our next question comes from Parker, a grade five student from Dundas. And they ask, what happens when black holes collide? Um, this is a great question, Parker, thank you. Um, and we, we are just able to, to begin to understand what happens when black holes collide. Um, in 2018, we, we were able to have the first observations of what are known as gravitational waves, which come from the interaction um, of two black holes. And what happens is these black holes, they begin to spiral in towards each other. And because they're so massive um, and they have so much energy, they, they create these waves, much like if you were to throw a rock into a pond. But these waves are not water waves and they're, they're not light waves or, or microwaves like we um, use in, in our kitchens. They're actually gravitational waves. So they're waves that actually cause um, the bending and the rippling of space-time itself. So we can see this wave-like structure coming off of this interaction of two black holes that are colliding. And by an incredible feat of, of science and engineering, um, here on Earth, we're able to make observations of these gravitational waves um, using these telescopes known as LIGO. So there are a few in, in the United States, and then this one here, uh, Cassina, is in Italy. But we're able to predict what these waves might look like when two black holes collide, and that's what we see here. We have this sort of wave structure and, and these uh, up and down motions. And we're able to observe with Livingston and Hanford independently these two signals. And when we put them over top of each other, they, they line up and they look the exact same. 
And this tells us that we're actually observing gravitational waves from the interaction and the collision of two black holes. Now, this is incredible, and, and Einstein's equations predicted that we would see this um, when two black holes collided, but it wasn't until recently that we were able to actually observe this um, in real life. Our next question is, is uh, the question of the hour, and um, from Elian, a grade one student in Ancaster, and they ask, what's inside a black hole? Now, Elian, thank you for your question. Um, I, I wish I could tell you, and, and that's something that astronomers um, and researchers would love to, to understand and to know about what's inside of a black hole. But to be honest with you, we aren't sure yet. We don't know. There are a number of theories um, that, that predict what might be inside of a black hole. But because a black hole doesn't emit light, we're unable to observe um, anything past its surface. We're not able to look inside of a black hole. Some of the theories suggest that there might be what's known as a singularity or a single mathematical point, which has all of the mass from those massive stars that we, that we talked about or these supermassive black holes. We have all of that mass at a single point in the center. And maybe if that black hole was spinning, we would see that not just the point, but we have a ring inside that black hole. Um, but, but it's hard for us to, to see inside and, and actually understand what might be inside of a black hole. These are all theories. And the reason why it's hard, if we go back to this image of M87 and the black hole that's at the center, we can see um, the shadow of the black hole here, this nice uh, circular ring. And at the surface, at the edge, right where it's interacting with this material, is what is known as the event horizon. And the event horizon is basically like the skin of the black hole. It's the surface. It's like the peel of an orange. And we can't see anything past the event horizon. No light is able to escape or be emitted from the black hole past this event horizon. So while we're able to understand maybe how the black hole interacts with its material surrounding it, we won't be able to see what's inside. Next question comes from Leandro, a grade four student in Ancaster, and they ask, can Earth get sucked into a black hole? Um, this is a great question. And um, thank you, Leandro, but no need to worry. Um, Earth cannot get sucked into a black hole. If we see the Milky Way galaxy here, it's a nice spiral galaxy with spiral arms, and there's a big bar in the center, and here's where the center of the galaxy is. This is where the sun and the solar system are. So Earth is here with the sun, nicely orbiting the Milky Way center. If we think about the black hole that's at the center of the Milky Way, Sagittarius A star, it's about 26,000 light years away from the sun. Now, when objects orbit black holes, and when we orbit the center of the Milky Way, um, we just happily go move along in our circle, circular or elliptical orbit. We never actually get closer to the center. And what I mean by that is black holes don't suck. Um, they're actually really cool. But black holes themselves only cause things to orbit or fall towards them. Um, black holes aren't like a vacuum cleaner sucking things in. In fact, if we were to replace our own sun um, in the solar system with a black hole of the same mass, nothing would change. Things here on Earth would be a lot colder and we wouldn't have the energy from the sun that we need in order to survive, but the planets would continue to orbit around the center of the solar system um, just as if the sun were there um, and nothing would get closer or further away. If we were to replace the sun with a black hole, nothing in our own solar system would change. Our next question comes from Shannon, uh, and they want to know, do you believe scientists will ever be able to explore within the black holes and find out the hidden secrets of the universe? Uh, this is a great question. Thank you, Shannon. Um, and much like, I, much like I said to Elian earlier, I'm not sure we'll be able to explore within the black holes themselves and find out what's maybe hidden inside of those. But we are able, um, with better telescopes that we're, that we're developing and creating as we move forward in science, um, to understand what's happening near black holes and how they might interact with their surrounding material. And what I mean by that is our own black hole here at the center of the Milky Way is hidden away from us. There's a lot of dust in the way. It's like you walk outside on a very windy day and it's kicking up dust from, from the street and you can't really see through. It's kind of foggy. Um, much in the same way, we're not able to um, observe and study the center of our own galaxy because there's a lot of material in front of us. But with new telescopes like Spitzer, or one that's coming online here, um, hopefully in the next few months, the James Webb Space Telescope, we're able to see through this dust um, and better observe the center 
uh, of the Milky Way. And what that will allow us to do is understand and study our own black hole, Sagittarius A star, and maybe understand how it interacts with the Milky Way and find out some of the hidden secrets that are involved with that. Also, there's a new telescope called LISA, which is hopefully going to be launched into space, where we're going to have three telescopes that are millions of kilometers away, but they're interacting with one another, they're talking with one another, even um, across this great distance in space. And they're able to observe, um, again, black hole collisions, much like we are starting to find up here with LIGO on Earth. Um, and this will allow us to understand more about gravitational waves and how, how those might um, unlock some of the hidden secrets of the universe um, from these great black hole uh, collisions. Um, but unfortunately, again, looking into a black hole is something that's quite challenging. Um, our next question comes from Reed, a grade four student in Dundas, and they ask, are there white holes in space? Um, and this is a great question, and um, some people might not have heard of white holes before, um, as lots of the conversations are around black holes. Um, and the, the simple question is no. Some simple answer is no. Um, I don't think that in, in reality we can have a white hole, but it's an interesting um, topic to talk about. Now, what is a white hole? A white hole is essentially the twin sibling of a black hole. Um, if we think of everything falling towards a black hole and, and time moving things toward that central region, a white hole would be the exact opposite or the time reversing of a black hole, where objects would not fall towards it, objects would fall away from it. And we can think of this falling towards a black hole and maybe falling out of a white hole kind of paradox of thinking. And in maybe a more science fiction kind of, kind of mindset and conversation, um, if a white hole were a, maybe a gateway to another universe, if we were in that other universe, we would see that white hole as a black hole and everything would work backwards. We would have that black hole in that new universe and things would be falling towards it. And then in our universe, we would see that black hole as a white hole and things would be falling out of it. So they're kind of this yin and yang twin sibling interaction between this black hole and this white hole. So mathematically and theoretically, uh, these white holes will exist, but in reality, um, I'm not sure if we'll ever be able to, to understand or, or study in great detail what these white holes might, might serve for us. And our final question comes from Elian, um, again, grade one student from Ancaster, and they ask, um, what is past space? And this is a great question, Elian, thank you for ending our, our webinar with this discussion. Um, and throughout the last uh, few decades, we're, we're, we've been able to understand more about how the universe was created um, and what's happening as it's expanding. So we, we have this theory about how everything started, here's the Big Bang, um, and then the universe has been slowly expanding since that um, Big Bang happened and we had our first stars and first galaxies form. Um, and then here is the present day where we live in our, happily in our Milky Way. Um, and what we have now know is that the universe itself is accelerating in its expansion. So what I mean by that is the universe is getting bigger, but it's getting bigger faster. So not only are objects moving further away from us as the universe grows, but it's actually speeding up. And so my answer to you is what is past space? Well, more space. Um, and what's past that? More space. And more space will continue to be created as this universe expands. And all that means, um, Elian, and for the rest of you tuning in today, is that there's more things to, to discover out there in the universe as it continues to grow. So thank you for tuning in today uh, for asking, watch, asking, watching Ask a Scientist. Again, my name is Blake. Um, this was brought to you by the McMaster Alumni Association. I hope that you learned something today that you can take to your family and friends. Uh, continue to stay safe and tune into this Hack of Science presentations. Thank you.